Well, good morning again. <clears throat> We've been looking at, um, during, during this season leading up to Thanksgiving, just some, some different perspectives on what does it mean to live a life of Thanksgiving? What does Thanksgiving look like? And I think it's fair to say that worship is an effective way that we express thanksgiving. Uh, to honor God is to live in a way of thanksgiving. And so this morning, I want to look at Romans 12, 1 and 2, which is a very familiar scripture, um, and look at what does living a life of thanksgiving look like. Verse 1 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as living and holy sacrifices, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, as a, a pastor, one of the more regular conversations that I have um, in, in my role as, as a pastor is people come to me and they say things along the lines of, I just can't seem to live the Christian life the way I know I'm supposed to, or I am frustrated in my Christian life, or I, I don't seem to ever have any victory. And I, I, I never seem to, to feel like I'm growing in my faith. I, I struggle with the simplest type of obedience. And, and you know, that I, I hear that a lot. And, and I even experience that from time to time, certainly in my own life. And, you know, I, I'm guessing that those and, and similar type of statements are things that are maybe familiar to you as well. Well, here is a, a thing to learn here. One of the characteristics of our broken nature, of our sinful nature, is that we tend to focus on ourselves. We, we naturally look to me. You know, I'm the center of my universe. And, and as a result, um, we are selfish. We are self-centered. That, does, that shouldn't shock anybody. But here's the thing. If you want to experience spiritual victory, if you want to experience the, the life that the Bible describes, then instead of looking to God for what He can do for you, you need to, once you have come to salvation, you need to learn to give rather than looking to receive. And, and there's a huge difference, obviously. There, you know, uh, think about it. People flock to church, and the number one reason people most often come to church is because they're, they're looking for something. You know, they're, they're coming saying, God, what, what can you give me? What, what's there for me? And, uh, you know, certainly uh, this would never be said about any of my sermons, um, but I, I suspect that it has been said of other people's sermons, I just don't get much out of that preacher's messages. Um, you know, I, I, like I said, I know that could never be the case with me. But, but the reality is, is there is that mindset, what's in it for me? And there, we need to have a, a change of perspective. And if you are wondering, well, what has God done for me? We're going to get into that here in just a moment. Uh, but if you want an in-depth study, read the first 11 chapters of the book of Romans. And that is an exhaustive display of what God has done for you. But what Paul is saying here in these two verses that I just read to you is based on everything that God has done for you, therefore live a life as a living sacrifice. 
That's, that's the mindset that, that is being presented here. The key to living the Christian life is to live as a sacrifice. And I really appreciated, and I'm going to give the Holy Spirit all of the credit for prompting Dory this morning, because in essence, that's exactly what she just communicated, is that it's about God. And I have to make my life all about God. Now, uh, you know, remember in John chapter 4, Jesus said the Father seeks true worshipers. God, God redeemed us in order for us to worship Him. He didn't redeem little old me so that I get to go to live, heaven and live happily ever after. I know that that's the mindset, but again, that's the selfish mindset. He redeemed me so that I would worship Him. That's the point. It's about God. It's not about me, and it's not about you. And as long as we live our life where we are thinking about ourselves and we are looking at ourselves, we are going to live defeated, unfulfilled lives. But when we turn and begin to focus on Christ and we make life about Christ and we live as living sacrifices then and only then will we know the fullness, the victory of the Christian life. And so Romans 3.3 3 defines a Christian as one who worships God in the Spirit, who rejoices in Christ Jesus and has no trust, no value in our, our flesh. Rome, uh, excuse me, 1 Peter 2 says, You are living stones, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So understand, you and I are spiritual priests. And what is it that a priest does? They offer up sacrifices. That's our job. Our job is to continually offer sacrifices to God. And so what kind of sacrifices? Well, Hebrews 13 gives us a really good picture. Let's continually offer up sacrifices of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips praising his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing for such sacrifices God is pleased. So we are to offer praise. We are to offer sacrifices of worship to God, and we are to, to do good. We are to love our neighbor as ourselves. So God has done everything for us. And the conclusion is, is that we give back to Him everything that we are. That, that's it in a nutshell. You can quit and we'll, we'll all go home now. Um, that, we're done. Not really. <laughs> we're going to get to that. I must confess, you know, though, in, in my own experience, this doesn't just happen naturally. It's not easy. It is absolutely necessary if we are to understand what God wants to accomplish in us, that, that we have to get this, this down to, to live as sacrifices, to, you know, in order to really honor God, to, in order to, to really give Him the service that we are supposed to as priests, then we have to get this. this. This is a command that we have been given. Now, let me, let me say honestly, most Christians never get here. Now, we love the world way too much. Uh, we indulge our flesh way too much. We love our pleasure. We love the desires of our old nature. And most, you know, I'm, I'm just speaking truth right now. Most Christians have embraced the world's mentality. We have embraced the world's philosophy. Most Christians are more at home in the world than they are in Christ. Just, just being honest now. We have bought into the world. And, and, you know, think about it. We entertain ourselves with the world's entertainments, like getting out in order to go to a game. Uh, we, 
We think along the lines of the world, and we never come to the place of commitment where these verses are describing. We never get there. Most, most people never experience the fullness of the Christian life, and as a result, they miss all that God has for them. They, they never understand this. They never enjoy this. And the central concept here is in verse 1 that be a living sacrifice. That is so important for us to understand. In the Old Testament, you know, they would offer a lamb or, or whatever kind of animal and they would kill it and they would put it on the altar. And that, that was the sum total of it. But the point of it was that they were basically saying this, this dead animal represents my, my submission to God. This, this dead animal represents the offering that, that I am acknowledging my, my failing of God. Well, Jesus, praise the Lord, fulfilled that. So we don't have to kill sheep anymore and, and put them on an altar. We, you know, thank goodness we don't have to do all of that. But the, the intention is still the same. The essential act, just as it was for a Jew in the Old Testament, it's still true for us that the sacrifice is proof of the genuineness of our faith in God. That's, that's the point of all of this. And so when we are living as living sacrifices, what we are saying is, is that I am placing myself on the altar of God as an expression of my devotion, as an expression of my commitment, as an expression of my submission to God. That's what being a living sacrifice is all about. You know, remember in 1 Samuel, it says, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And so what we are communicating is, is that by being in obedience to God, I am placing myself as a sacrifice on the altar. And, and that is the central piece as a, a new covenant Christian as a believer, our, our offering is our heart, our soul, our mind, our, our body as a living sacrifice. Psalm 51, 17, that, you know, again, this is Old Testament, says the way to please God is to be truly sorry deep in our hearts. This is the kind of sacrifice He won't refuse. Psalm 141, 2, accept my prayer like a gift of burning incense, the words I lift up like an evening sacrifice. So nothing has really changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament other than instead of offering a lamb or a dove or something like that, Jesus was offered. And so we are to live by faith, placing our lives at the, at the behest of God, saying, God, I give you me. That, that's the, the essence here. And so we see in these two verses, there's four pieces that we are to, to offer. Um, it, 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 we are to offer our soul, our body, our mind, and our will. And if that sounds kind of familiar, well, the great commandment, Mark 12, 30, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. It hasn't changed. We are to give God everything that we are. And the first thing that we have to offer, this is the first part of it, is we have to offer our, our soul to God. It starts there. You can't, I can't, nobody can offer anything to God until He has our soul. That's, that's the beginning. You know, here Paul is speaking to believers that he says, my brothers and sisters, I beg you, so he's speaking to other believers. He's not just speaking to, to random people. And you know, when he refers to them as my brothers and sisters, he's, he's saying to them, 
I'm, I'm speaking to you as, as fellow Christians. Nothing can be offered to God if the soul hasn't been offered first. An unsaved person can't give anything to God. They can't give their mind. They can't give their will. They can't give anything. 1 Corinthians 2 says that the unsaved person can't even understand the things of God. I'm going to read Romans 8.8 8 to you in the Phillips translation. It says, The carnal attitude sees no further than natural things, but the spiritual attitude reaches out after the things of the Spirit. The former attitude means, bluntly, death. The latter means life and inward peace. And this is only to be expected, for the carnal attitude is inevitably opposed to the purpose of God. And neither, can, um, and neither can nor will follow his laws or living. People who hold this attitude cannot possibly please God. So an unredeemed person can't please God, period. No matter what they do, no matter how hard, not that they would try. Because the fact is an unsaved person has no interest in the things of God. And so the first step is you have to give God your soul. And then he says, by the mercies of God. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, we as followers of Christ, as believers, have experienced the mercies of God. The mercies of God are everything that God has done for the believer. I'm going to go through just real quickly, again, from Romans 1 all the way up through chapter 11, Paul just goes over, he's like a rototiller, he's just tilling up all of these things that God has done, all of these mercies. First of all is salvation. We have been given salvation. That is a mercy of God. He has given us love. He has demonstrated His love to us. And Romans 8 says, nothing can separate us from God's love. He has given us grace. All the way through 11 chapters, he keeps talking about grace, a mercy of God. We have been given God's Holy Spirit. He, he has come to dwell in the heart of every believer. That is a mercy that God has given us. He is a comforter. He is a, an encourager that we have. He has given us peace. In, in four different chapters, Paul talks about the peace that we have because God has given it to us. We have faith mentioned over 20 times in those 11 chapters. We have comfort. We have power. We have hope. We have patience. Well, okay, some of us have patience. Um, we have kindness. We have glory. We have honor. We have righteousness. We have forgiveness. We have reconciliation. We have justification. These are mercies given to us by God. We have eternal security. We have eternal life. We have spiritual freedom from sin. We have the promise of the resurrection. We have been adopted by God. We have intercession where we can pray for one another. We have the ability to talk to God. These are mercies that God has given us, that God has poured out on us. And again, the, the idea of mercy is we don't deserve it, but we've been given it. So what should be our response? How should we respond? Well, rather than I, I'm going to ask you a little different way. If a person really understands this, then what is the only possible mindset that we could have? And that should be my greatest desire is to give God all that I am and all that I have to Jesus Christ. That, that really can't, there can't be another answer than that. And, and so that word therefore is saying, because of everything God has done for us, therefore we should give our lives as living sacrifices. 
The second thing the, the text tells us is that our body must be given. Now understand by body, I'm not just talking about flesh and bone. That's not what the, the Bible's talking about. The body is everything you are apart from your soul. All right? So your mind, your will, everything else is, is your body. And the, the, it's hard because the body is where our unredeemed part is, our humanness. When Christ comes into a life, we get a new soul, but we still got the old jalopy core or, or exterior. And Romans 6.12 says, but don't let sin control your life here on earth. You must not be ruled by the things your sinful self makes you want to do. Now, sin lives in our, our mortal body, and, and we can't allow it to have control. Uh, again, Romans 6.13, don't offer the parts of your body to serve sin. Uh, you know, in Romans, uh, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 6, it says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? So we need to understand that this, this person that we are wants to do what is not right because it's still an unredeemed body. But the Holy Spirit in you desires to, to honor and serve Christ. And so what we have to do is we have to make the unredeemed part of us, the, the still broken part of us, submit to the will of the Holy Spirit that, that is the Lord in our life. And it, there, there is a conflict there. And, and so we have to... We have to really commit to this process. First Thessalonians 4 says, He wants all of you to learn to control your own bodies. You must live in a way that is holy. You must live with honor. Don't desire to commit sexual sins like people who don't know God. Now, it's scary to think of the power that our, our flesh has. It is so easy for us to slip in. And again, I'm not just talking about physical actions. It's the, our mindsets. We can, we can sit there with our hands clasped, sitting in church, and be thinking some really wicked, evil, nasty stuff. We have to learn to control all of who we are. You know, we, we are born again, and we have the Holy Spirit in us. But this flesh, this body has power to sabotage us. And so we have to learn to make it be in submission. The Apostle Paul wrestled with this in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. He says, I discipline my body and bring it under strict control so that after preaching to others, I myself will not be disqualified. You know, you hear about that happening to preachers all the time where they, they have these ministries and they do great things, but they allow their flesh to take them down a path that they shouldn't have gone down, and it ruins their ministry. It ruins their, their testimony to the world. We're all susceptible. You're a susceptible. I'm susceptible. And we have to discipline ourselves. So we are to offer our bodies as living sacrifices. It means that it's a continual thing. You know, uh, just as an animal was killed and put on the altar, you are to put yourself on the altar. God wants a perpetual, a living sacrifice, an ongoing sacrifice. Uh, and it says... You know, it's the idea that I am giving myself everything that I, I am, I am giving it to God. And I, it is going to be the focal point. It is the priority of my life. I will surrender to you, God, whatever you tell me to do, no matter what it is, I will do it. That's the mindset. There's a wonderful story I came across. There is this Christian man living in China. Um, this is back in the 1800s, just so you kind of have a context. And at that point in time, 
They were loading up Chinese men by the, the thousands, hundreds of thousands. And this is when they were bringing them to the U.S. to build the railroads and things like that. Well, they were also loading them up by the thousands and taking them to Africa to work in the diamond mines and the, the precious metal mines down in Africa. And there was this man by the I'm going to call him Lo. He had, it, it's a long name, but um, he had come to Christ under the ministry of a Southern Baptist missionary who had gone to China. And he was moved with compassion because he saw his own countrymen that were being carried off essentially as slaves and being taken down to these mines, knowing that most of them would end up dying down there. And so he sold himself as a slave and went down to Africa as a slave to work in the mines, but his real purpose was to take the gospel to these people who he knew weren't going to get the gospel any other way. He died while he was down there. He never came home. But that's what a living sacrifice looks like. And maybe that just scared 90% of you and you're thinking, eh, that's not for me. But I'm telling you, when you're in the center of God's will, that's the only place to be. You can, you can be the richest person on earth and have the best life in the world, but if you're not in the center of God's will, that's the worst place to be. Living sacrifice means that God calls the shots. It involves everything about who you are. And just like an animal that was put on the, the altar had to be a perfect sacrifice, it couldn't be lame, it couldn't be you know, sick or anything like that. Well, that's what we are to be when we place ourselves on the altar to God. And, and uh, the idea is to be set apart. God wants your best. He wants your physical self at the best that you are, in, even in your humanness. So when we come to God, we can't come to God with kind of a yeah attitude. You know, again, we are so comfortable in this society. We're, we're willing to serve God so long as it doesn't cost us, so long as we get out by the time the game starts. You know, we're willing to serve God yeah, if, if it doesn't interfere with my favorite TV program, we're willing to serve God you know, if, if I can work it in. That's not an acceptable sacrifice. And if we do it with that kind of approach, God says, keep your garbage. I don't want it. That's not an acceptable sacrifice. God wants us to offer our best to who he is. Understand, real worship isn't elaborate prayer, prayers. It isn't beautiful music. It isn't stained glass. It isn't heating and air conditioning. Real worship is giving God your best from your heart, from an attitude of devotion and prayer and praise and honor. Now, the third is the mind has to be given to God. That's verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world. We could spend a lot of time there, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Here, what Paul is telling us is a basic key is that your mind has to be renewed. You can't keep your mind the way of the world. This world, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to edumacate you here a little bit. This world belongs to Satan, all right? It is an instrument of Satan's. This world, when, when, and when, by world, I'm talking about, and what the Bible is talking about is the morality, the ethics, the, the societal norms, the, the political structures, the, the, the values, the everything that constructs society, okay? It is a instrument of satanic purposes. 
You know, Satan uses the world system to promote his goals, uh, his ambitions. And, and you see it in the pride, boastfulness, arrogance, corruption, um, and, and on and on and on. And so the spirit of this world is, is presented to us constantly. It's like a, a, a waterfall that just never stops. You get it through the music, you get it through the movies, you get it through media, you get it through all your entertainment, you get it through sports, you get it through everything. Everything that this world is about is satanic. I'm not mincing words here. There is no gray area. It is black or white. It is either for Christ or it is for Satan. Period. Understand that. So when you're saying, oh, it's not that bad to watch this movie or something along those lines, yeah, it is. A little bit of arsenic is still arsenic. Understand that. Draw that line in the sand. This is part of being a living sacrifice that you say, I will not go any further. Or, you know, just, just get that mindset. In 1 John 5, 19, we know that we are children of God. We know that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Be not conformed. That's the message here. Stop allowing yourself to be molded by the world. And, and the assumption is we are being molded by the world. That's the point. Don't allow it. Recognize it for what it is and draw the line and say, I'm not going any further. I'm not allowing this. You know, it, it, it's mind boggling if you stop and think about it in, in realistic terms as a new creation, if you have Jesus Christ living in you, how crazy is it that we would want to reflect the world? But we do. You know, we want to wear the clothes they wear. We want to watch the movies they watch. We want to, we want to hold the values that the world has. And understand that every bit of that belongs to Satan. Every bit of it. We need to understand that for, for the truth that it is. And Paul says, be transformed. That, that, that's metamorphosized. We are to be totally changed. We don't want to be totally changed. We want to only be changed a little bit. Just enough to get me into heaven. You know, that, that's all I care about. Well, that's wrong. That is not, the, that is not a godly attitude. Stop allowing yourself to be conformed and instead start being transformed. That's the mindset. 2 Corinthians 3.18, we are being changed to become more like him so that we have more and more glory. And this glory comes from the Lord who is the Holy Spirit. How do you get it? By renewing your mind. How do you renew your mind? David said it, your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin. You must, you must become inundated with the word of God. Just like you're inundated by the world, you've got to shut the world off and turn the word of God on. You have to absolutely commit to this. And then finally, the will. When we completely commit to God and His way, the first thing that we will understand is His will is always perfect. His will is always the right way. And so there becomes no contest. You know, right now, God will say, you should do this, or God will promote it, you know, lay something out before us, and we'll kind of go, oh, I don't know about that. I I think I need to pray about that. You know, and, and the reality is, is when we understand God's will is perfect, it's a no-brainer. We just say, I'm in. I will do what God called me to do. People might look at this man from China and say, well, it didn't turn out good for him. I would disagree. 
He did exactly what God wanted him to do, and he's in glory right now, and he is celebrating at the foot of the, the, the throne of God. He won. That, we don't care what the world says. We shouldn't care what the world says, but we should care what God says. So this is, it's a package. You can't present yourself if you haven't renewed your mind and if you haven't submitted your will. But when you do, when you renew your mind, you will become submissive to God's will and you will offer your body and you will be a living sacrifice. The key is a saturated mind, an obedient mind, a body presented. And you don't do this just once. This is a day-by-day, hour-by-hour commitment. I catch myself even in, when we're here in worship with my mind trying to go different places. You know, I'm thinking about what I need to say, or I'm thinking about this, or I'm thinking about that. And, and you know, even when I'm trying to worship, my mind wants to go different places. So understand that this is going to be a, a matter of, as Paul said, we are disciplining ourselves to godliness. That's, that's what we're trying to do. Stop making you the sinner. Stop making you and your will and your want be the priority. Crucify your will. Become a living sacrifice where you are submitting to God. And let God renew your mind because you are, you are digging deep into the Word of God. And you're consecrating yourself, your body, your mind, your will, your thoughts, your, yourself constantly to God. And you will begin to live as a sacrifice. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that our hearts are convicted today. I pray for your Holy Spirit to move in our midst. I pray for you to challenge us, to break down the barriers that we have allowed, that we have even intentionally put up. And God, I pray for you to transform us. Lord, I understand that it doesn't just happen. It's an intentional action where we willingly submit to you. And Lord, my prayer is that it happens in each of our hearts. Lord, I know that it, it's, it's something in my own life that, that needs to be, be there. God, I pray for this transformation and I pray for the, the work and the ministry of your Holy Spirit to, to just tear into us, Lord. Bring about the, the change that needs to be made. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.